Voilà, ça y est. Okay, welcome back. Thank you for once again being with us at La Scène Musicale or remotely. Welcome back. To open this, uh, this session, uh, the first contribution comes from uh, Nikita Stazinchin. Uh, it's an honor to us to welcome him. Uh, to the stage is in charge of development and implementation of state policy and legal regulation, uh, such as defining the housing policy and managing the development of housing, mortgage lending, housing cooperatives, rental housing market, and he supervises the Department of Housing Policy of the Ministry of Construction, Housing and Utilities of the Russian Federation. Please a big round of applause for the Deputy Minister of Construction, Housing and Utilities of the Russian Federation, Mr. Nikita Stasichin. Merci beaucoup de l'accueillir. Good morning. You know, today uh, I want uh, to talk about urban housing, uh, including claims and uh, development. Uh, I will focus in um, First of all, in uh, Russian experience, but after I hope we can have a good talk about uh, global development. Uh, the main police document today in Russian uh, for urban development is a national project which name is Housing and Urban Environment. Russian government has um, adopted national projects uh, for different areas uh, to help uh, Stirage the next steps for economic stability and development. So, uh, for what we need uh, special national project for national project. First of all, uh, the national project helps national government and uh, regional government focused uh, and uh, have a similar uh, understanding of necessary measures. We hope to develop a mortgage market, uh, increase the numbers of loans. Uh, and said their errors to less than 8%, because uh, today uh, we built about uh, 80 million square meter for a year. It's too much, but you know, uh, uh, we have, of course, big cities, big regionals, but we have small cities where live people who want to have beautiful, um, industrial housing, they want to have good life, and um, when we talk with them, uh, we just want to know uh, what kind of city they want to change, in what kind of uh, territories uh, they want to change in their city. It's, it's very, very, um, first of all, it's very, I think, uh, difficult uh, to uh, tell the regional government how to how they need to build in, what they need to build in, what want people who live in their cities, uh, and what they want uh, to have uh, from after two or three years. When we speak about for whom we do it, for us, I think uh, we need to think about uh, our children because uh, you know maybe. 10, 15 years later, uh, the building, the development will be absolutely uh, stopped if we now don't change some rules how to build, how to uh, have uh, to plan. Uh, first, uh, uh, we have to plan uh, not district development, uh, but I think block development, uh, we can focus on comfort. It's very important for our country. It's very important for our people who live, and it, it will be very, very important for our children who will live after us, because in this place, in these uh, areas, uh, and they will have uh, many, many, some special objects for this. Uh, what about COVID, and what about what happens in our country. You know, uh, we stopped all development in two regions, Moscow and Moscow region. We stopped for two days, uh, uh, for 
two months, but two days, uh, about 15 billion square uh, developments. It was very difficult to uh, start them uh, after pandemia because, um, you know, we many people who work in a building in uh, our government uh, don't, doesn't understand how to open uh, all develops uh, before we can uh, that it was that it will be not so dangerous uh, uh, when it was occurred because now of course uh, we have a special standard uh, uh, which we uh, which we go give to all the regional government to all the planes uh, all the buildings uh, and all the company now uh, work with this standard. It's very good for people uh, who work there, it's very good for people who live near, and it's very good for all uh, construction. You know, in 10 years later, we need to um, build about 120 million square a year. It's much, it's, um, but uh, the, the main question uh, how to build it uh, in uh, many regions because and I think that uh, when the national project go we need to know uh, that all the regional government in our country uh, can do it uh, won't do it and how to do it that's I think we need to discuss thank you very much Thank you, a big thank you, uh, Mr. Nikita Stavinsin. Uh, Let's now switch to our panel discussion. As you know, this uh, forum is an opportunity for people to interact. Uh, let me just remind you that uh, around 3 p.m. this afternoon, we're going to have a, a, a panel conference with, uh, on the Champs-Élysées, uh, re the re-enchantment of the Champs-Élysées, the Parisian Champs-Élysées. And hopefully we will get an opportunity to discuss this as well with the mayor of Paris. Um, opened by the, the, the minister is a very uh, interesting uh, session to discuss the lessons uh, learned from the COVID-19 uh, crisis for the built environment. What are the key issues, what are the challenges uh, in terms of uh, mobility, urban density, infrastructure, urban planning, housing markets, many subjects, and uh, how to analyze the, the main factors that have changed our urban lives and the industry since the beginning of uh, this pandemia, which was at the beginning of March, and how to imagine the world of tomorrow, how to imagine the city of tomorrow. These are the different topics we, uh, we will uh, discuss uh, together, uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, um, to thank uh, the two persons, the two experts that will be uh, with us, um, the, the mayor of Rome, uh, Virginia Raggi, uh, she's uh, in Rome, but uh, here in Paris and online uh, through streaming. And the uh, mayor of Paris, Mrs. Anne Hidalgo. Anne Hidalgo nous rejoint. And Hidalgo is joining us, and I think we have Virginia Raji with us. Good to have you. Thank you, Mrs. Hidalgo, for uh, being with us. It is a pleasure to have you with us this morning. We're going to uh, interact. Uh, we're going to give the floor to the mayor of Rome. Um, she uh, was kind enough to accept our invitation. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Uh, my, my first question, um, thank you uh, once again to, to join us today. What are the consequences of the, this major city we are faced with, according to you, and from the Rome and Italy point of view? Okay, so thank you, first of all, thank you all, and thank you for the privilege, opportunity to exchange and sharing, even if we are online and not in person. 
Uh, well, I think that the global crisis generated by the spread of the COVID-19 disease is unprecedented. It is a crisis that affected directly and indirectly our economies, have it the trade exchange, the free movement of people, the inner DNA of our societies. The pandemic mainly affected cities, the main place for socializing, the place where people choose to live together, where they work, they study, create bonds, meet, develop their creativity and their future. So the real challenge to me uh, is of this time is the resilience. Resilience today can be declined in three directions. The three R, we can say, initials of Rome, but also of reinvest, regeneration, and restart. So let's start. If you want, you talk about reinvest, regeneration, and restart. And I'll start with uh, reinvesting, meaning targeting specific action and investments. Yes, reinvesting to me means returning to invest, to use and manage all the available resources for the promotion of person and of the territory. Investing in creativity in factories and theater. In one word, investing in our communities. We need, in the COVID era, fast, effective, and above all, flexible responses. Recession, in, in time of recession, we must plan a season of strong public investment that shall bring about new administrative regulations. Today, Rome, which is a capital of 3.5 million people, look to the other European capitals like Paris or Berlin, which have peculiar structures and articulation of power. Keywords so are de-bureaucratization, de digitalization, research, innovation and technology, and shared electric and sustainable mobility. So, second part, it's regeneration. What does it mean for the built environment? Well, regeneration means giving back to citizens places that sometimes have been abandoned, unused, or no longer necessary to the territory. Places that can become engine of a redevelopment of entire neighborhoods, being able to introduce new function into the urban fabric, like residential, social, cultural, commercial, sustainable economy, and technological development. And they can thus contribute to improving the urban quality and livability of the city. So the last, let's talk about the new future with you, uh, Virginia Raji, restarting, meaning startling, starting differently. Exactly, restarting is the last key word. Culture, hospitality, and tourism are, the, are, are I can say, our key words for the restart. Culture represents Rome uh, DNA. Over 200 archaeological sites and areas, an inestimable open-air artistic heritage that we have. Outdoor living and outdoor fruition uh, of the archaeological heritage make Rome an enjoyable and safe city for the return of international tourists. UNWTO Secretary General made his first visit abroad after COVID emergence in Rome, an icon of international tourism, wishing a fast recovery of tourism in Rome and anywhere else. The recovery from the crisis must be inclusive. It is necessary to start again together as a community. We need to emphasize a particular type of resilience, social resilience. The social closeness is our vision of the city, a city where no one is left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking part. It was a, an honor to have you, Virginia Raji. Je vous demande d'applaudir, Virginia Raji. Merci beaucoup. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Au revoir. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, ça, ça donne le ton. Uh, okay, I think it just sets uh, the tone. Uh, thank you, and Hidalgo, for being with us uh, this morning. I think we just heard a lot of interesting things. Turning to you. Uh, and uh, thinking about all the things that you have um, uh, engaged in, uh, radical transformation programs in the city, you've been very, very committed in changing public space, mobility. Uh, we just had the example of, uh, of Rome and the consequences the crisis has had on, 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 on Rome. How much, uh, what, ha what has been the impact of COVID-19 on, on your work? 
Well, I think it confirms that we have to accelerate things. We have to continue things. When we uh, started in Paris, uh, when we decided to engage in this ecological and uh, energetic transition, we uh, carefully analyzed what needed to be changed um, in the area of mobility, for example, giving uh, a, a more room or space to active mobility, such as uh, walking, uh, cycling, um, I think that this uh, has been um, uh, has been one of our key efforts, uh, and people are sometimes very conservative. But then, when you see what's happening today, it looks like you are actually spearheading. Uh, you are ahead of the others. Yes, I, I, I think so indeed. I think the coronavirus simply shows that we need a different model. We we need a new model with new solutions. And uh, when we talk about environmentalism, ecology, living together, better life together, when we see how the quality of life needs to be improved, it, it goes through uh, profound changes, sometimes radical changes in our economic model and how we travel and how we consume and how we produce. And um, what, what the, the, the health crisis reveals is uh, that in the times to come, in, in, in the future, more and more, our societies will need to be resilient. And we, um, I, th I think Virginia Raji just said this, we've worked extensively on this concept and we've tried to translate this in concrete ways. Our human societies collectively as human beings uh, uh, in our cities, we, we need to be prepared to anticipate crises and overcome crises. How do we do this? Well, by informing the population, by engaging, involving people, and that's very much what you do. Absolutely, that's what we do. We involve people as much as we can. And I think that one of the key lessons of the COVID-19 crisis, which is not over, by the way, is that we should not uh, abandon our objectives. Um, uh, I, I think that they're very, uh, very compatible, and they will help us become even more resilient when facing uh, health risks. We had anticipated some scenarios. In the city of Paris, we, we had a big focus, which was on the risk of terrorism. Uh, of course, for obvious historical uh, reasons, uh, especially with the trial of uh, the Shardi attacks. We, 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 we focused a lot to see what it takes to recover after terrorist attacks. The, uh, the impact of the terrorist atta uh, uh, attacks had been terrible. On, uh, the impact on tourism was terrible. Okay, so we shouldn't really talk about before and after, but instead we need to talk about a more resili resilient cities, more flexible cities, absolutely. And that goes through citizens first. We have, a, we have objectives, very clear objectives, with uh, a very strong environmental chapter but also a very so strong social chapter. People must be informed. People have to be engaged and involved. And uh, I think one of the learnings of the COVID-19 crisis is um, that, that, that we, we have spearheaded a, 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 a number of, of, of initiatives. We've identified the people who were really is indispensable in cities, even when it is being hit hard, even when the city comes to a standstill because of the lockdown. There are people we need. There's, we need those who are responsible of our health, healthcare professionals, those who watch after the more, most fragile people, public, private sectors, non-for-profit organizations. It's all the invisibles, all the invisibles who became visible. Those who are responsible for the food supply, uh, cashiers working in supermarkets and grocery stores, and so on. All these people, by definition, um, uh, are, are, are people who are, are even more important in cities um, that, that, that are speculating, where real estate prices are skyrocketing. And in, in these cities, we need them even more. There will be other crises. There will be more. 
the, those key people, key players, need to be inside. They can't be pushed out of cities where they would have to travel back and forth long hours to commute to work. We need to build cities, the human communities together in a much more consistent way, in a more coherent way by integrating mixity. These are very important lessons and they influence how we manage cities, how we organize them, uh, how we urbanize them. Urbanism is, uh, is that, is just that. Uh, right, and uh, instead of having, uh, you, you talked about having a more inclusive vision, and then we have this social and health crisis that hits us, that hits us very hard. Tell us a little bit about all how the the, 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 turban, the the urban fabric has changed and, 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 and why. Well, I think that a lot of the changes we, 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 we've gone through, we needed to make those changes. If we had not done this over the past six years, we would be considerably behind right now. We wouldn't be in the right position to allow citizens to live uh, good lives, acceptable lives, pleasant lives, uh, where they're not impacted by pollution like uh, we've been in, in the past. So if we hadn't done all this, uh, imagine what people would say or think about Paris. Of course, it's never easy. I was sharing this with Gregory Doucet, who is the mayor of the city of Lyon. Um, it's very difficult. People are, a lot of people are very conservative and it is in the interest of a lot of people to not change anything because they're, they're in good shape and they, want to, they, want, they, they don't want things to change. But I think the vast majority of people do have an interest in change and want change. They want environmental change. They want to improve their purchasing power. They want more inclusion. They want to live better lives together. And um, for the French at large, I think that the, the very question of the republic, um, what it means to be a republic, I think is also very much um, at question. Um, and, and taken into consideration. Of course, we have all the visible changes, all the visible transformations with Emmanuel Grégoire, my first deputy, and, and other people who are here in the room. We have take, we've made two important decisions, two governance decisions that we're going to apply from now on. Based on the previous term, what we learned from my first term, and the COVID-19 crisis. The first uh, commitment is that more and more we're going to deconcentrate. We're going to uh, give more and more authority to each of the neighborhoods and each of the so-called arrondissements in Paris to be closer to the people, closer to the field. So we're going to deconcentrate, deconsolidate. And we need, of course, to have a long-term vision. Uh, we're a large city. Same thing is true for Rome, uh, Lyon, uh, Paris, and many other uh, um, foreign capitals. We need this very strong connection with, uh, with the field, with people. We need, uh, you know, we need to uh, uh, consider things at a micro-local level. Thanks to Carlos Moreno, we have worked very, very hard, and we, we came to uh, realize that people need to recognize one another. Within 15 minutes of where you live, people need to find everything they need, all services, kindergartens, uh, public services, culture, and so on. So within 15 minutes, we need, to, which means, of course, uh, this requires public transportation, mass transit, and so on. And then there is the question of governance. We talked about governance. It's not top down anymore, and this is a major revolution. There's a second important topic I wanted to discuss with you, um, which, of course, uh, is uh, of great interest to all of the people in this room or following online. How do you think? construction can mutate, can transform itself, and of course, 
how could you bring a little bit of reassurance to people in the construction sector? We all need to be aware that we all need to change, and people have already started to change and over the past six years as mayor. And with uh, Jean-Louis Missica, who was also deputy mayor, we have uh, worked on reinventing Paris through a project called Réinventer Paris, where we uh, changed our approach, uh, another approach than that of the ZAC system. We moved down to a more grassroots level and uh, used a call for projects uh, where professionals of the construction sector, other economic stakeholders, uh, companies involved in social housing, but also in private housing, but also community groups in the field could work together on proposals. So a co-construction survey, indeed. Indeed, and there are some very beautiful projects that have already been brought to fruition. For instance, the uh, Ferme du Rail in the 19th arrondissement, where uh, there are shared gardens, allotments, uh, social, uh, the social economy, and also to make it economically viable. Of course, there are also private sector activities. But what a lot of uh, people in real estate have told me about the process we initiated six years ago is that we have all moved forward. We have all made progress. If we, as the public authorities, had not said, let's change, let's change our methods, let's try to show that it's a win-win situation, I'm not sure that they would have wanted to. So you created a kind of virtuous circle, is that it? Yes, in a sense, and I think we're going to continue to uh, put forward that uh, signal. And uh, I think we can now witness that in construction, there is now increased use of biosource materials, of wood, uh, there is reuse of materials, there's also construction site management, which has greatly improved. A lot of things are prefabricated outside, and, and all of this has made progress. And then um, there's also a crucial tool, which is the PLA, the Local Urbanism Plan that will be one of the assignments for Emmanuel Grégoire in order to engage this revision of the local urban plan to factor in issues of uh, environmental energy efficiency, adapting cities to climate change with surfaces that must be planted, uh, that should really be built into this uh, PLU, which is, of course, a crucial plan. So it's interesting. Now you do things, you build things in before as a prerequisite rather than doing things after. Yes, it's a prerequisite. Of course, the PLU, when revised, uh, there will be a uh, conference of citizens in the next Council of Paris Assembly. All of these issues will be discussed with the uh, Municipal Council. And I am very eager that uh, we, along with uh, profession can drive each other. We live in a world where we must accept a number of uh, aspects of the economic model, and I fully agree with what Virginia was saying earlier. This is not just restarting uh, in order for us to do the same thing as before. We are restarting and in this accelerating restart, we need to challenge the model. We need to challenge the economic model. What is the purpose of all this? What we do must be useful to human beings. And we need to question very openly uh, without being catalogued uh, or called uh, uh, or called names. We need to be in a capacity to question who should progress be serving? 
That is a crucial question for human societies, for uh, politicians, not only to be fearful of progress, but to keep progress under control and put it at the service of the greater number. Otherwise, it won't work. If it's only a tiny minority of the population of this planet decides for everyone else and are the only ones uh, who have an interest in uh, changing world. So, Anne Hidalgo, you're always uh, promoting this, uh, promoting ideals of inclusion, co-construction, uh, citizen involvement. But if we uh, drill deeper for all the, the real estate and construction professionals who are following this, uh, that's a new trend that is picking up, uh, is now uh, mutability, transformability, and mixed uses in construction. You need to work from home or bring your office closer to home. Yes, it's true, and that transformation is something that we need to work on together. And in the PLU that we voted for in 2006, there's a, a great plan uh, where we put uh, the share of uh, housing versus office space to avoid all of the east-west uh, commuting. We had worked already on a pretty effective PLU, but today, and notably with the unprecedented economic crisis that will be appearing because of COVID, uh, we need to question uh, the role of construction. In my previous term of office, we worked with uh, professionals in the sector to transform 350,000 square meters of office space into housing. I think, again, we're going to need to work further on that issue. We have a, a tool called the APUR, the Paris Urbanism Workshop, but we've also worked with the regional prefect to go further and to identify and earmark a number of buildings that can be transformed from uh, economic activity towards housing. And I believe that if we are to rebuild the city over the city, uh, that is something we need to work on together. And we need to work with the sector to see how they can be incentivized to take that path. Uh, but I certainly believe that the time has come. Of course, a crisis can be something that you can just uh, suffer from and just hope for a return to the situation in the past. Or else, you can consider that, of uh, course, we uh, would have well done very well without the crisis. There were many uh, fatalities, many people are sick, a lot of tension in healthcare, but the situation can also be leveraged to accelerate and try to move forward a more balanced, a more equal, fairer world. And I think that even on the side of businesses and their economic model, and particularly uh, in the field of construction and real estate, we can work together. So indeed, we saw during this crisis that the relationship with cities, with uh, housing, uh, seems to have uh, focused on increased inequality. So um, research was conducted, but it seems that the majority of the French, when asked what their ideal home would be, uh, the results were rather unexpected. Uh, people said, I would like something with more air, because I'd like to work from home, uh, with a little garden, or perhaps a terrace or a deck. Yes, absolutely, that's the direction we're taking. Uh, Paris is an extremely dense, densely uh, built city. It's the densest city in Europe, 20,000 inhabitants per square meter, and Virginia uh, has a very large city with a lot of space. So we're a densely built city in which we have managed to reconquer some space uh, for green spaces or for other uses than cars. 
and uh, that is where we found the most space to reconquer, and that's what we did. Uh, space is dedicated to, to cars, but uh, people's apartments tend to be rather small. The middle classes in Paris often choose to stay in Paris in a smaller flat, and they very often say, that they want to stay in Paris because Paris has an educational, cultural, and economic environment that allows them to thrive and think about a future for their children. So they accept the constraint of a smaller apartment. But during lockdown, when people had to stay within these tiny apartments, it creates tensions. So, of course, the public space, which is, in a sense, a common extension of the private space of people in a given neighborhood becomes something crucial. And that's what we're working on. For instance, in the city of the uh, 15 minutes uh, of travel that we're working on would be that everywhere in Paris and also outside Paris, um, life is very much organized around schools, even for people who don't have kids. The neighborhood is very much conditioned by how schools work. So the schools must become the central focus points, and they must be more open. They must uh, be more welcoming. And they must be there uh, to welcome people, for instance, uh, when there's a heat wave, uh, to make sure that there's more vegetation in the school yards. We have already started working on that. Uh, we call them the oasis courtyards. That was part of our strategy. So you're saying that schools could serve as a focal point to attract people? Yes, they could also, at the weekend or at night, they could be more welcoming in these oasis courtyards. They could welcome perhaps people who need fresh air or a little bit of space for kids to play in at the weekend if you can't make it all the way to the nearest public park, but you could use these schools as a, a destination for a together, togetherness within a neighborhood. So these are extremely interesting developments. Uh, it's highly, uh, of course, uh, it can create some anxiety, but it's also very exciting. And if you engage with professionals, with citizens, with uh, community groups, and with elected representatives, I think we could probably really come up with um, very practical solutions that would be a manner uh, of saying that the vision of the uh, green transition is uh, not something that is a myth, that is totally unreachable. Things can be constructed in a very practical way and much quicker than we believe. So you're talking about social diversity as something um, that would also be concerned. Yes, of course. In Paris, very clearly, uh, the real estate market is highly speculative. I'm often asked, and they say, ah, oh, yes, but what have you done about um, the uh, real estate market? Well, not very much, because I have no power, no leverage, apart from obtaining what I obtained, which was regulation of rents. Um, conversely, where I have been able to act is on the production of social housing, of affordable housing. And we've now reached 23% affordable housing, which is huge for a major capital city. And that's perfectly in line with uh, our targets. In 2001, the number was 13%, so up 10%. These are not just figures. That just means that there are about 600,000 people who have access to affordable housing and who can live in Paris and who otherwise would not have been able to live in Paris. And these 600,000 people are families, very often middle class families, lower middle class, working class people who, of course, make a valuable contribution to the city's uh, services and economy. 
And really this question of social diversity and mixity, um, we have been fought um, fiercely in the past. But I mean, there, there are various aspects to that, of course. There's a philosophical standpoint, a political standpoint, an altruistic standpoint. But you can also take things into consideration through an economic approach. In order for a city to work, yes. it needs to be mixed, it needs to be diverse, because if a city was purely a locus that allows the richest, those who can afford private services and private housing, the city would lose its attractiveness. A city draws people because it is diverse, and when it is diverse. Look at a city like Paris. Paris has an ecosystem of innovation which is highly efficient, and I believe that that is probably due to the diversity of Paris's population and the fact that part of these creative people chose to come to Paris to create their startups to bring their ideas to fruition because they have this capacity, this ability to live in a city, a highly cosmopolitan city with lots of different people from all walks of life. And in order to shorten distances within Paris, if you have shorter distances, you can enjoy uh, other aspects such as the cultural and educational aspects. So I would like you perhaps to send out a message to all of the people in the trade of our construction and real estate uh, sector. You were talking about inclusiveness in co-constructing the city of the future and the impulse you have given to that. What, what would your message be to them? I would say, do not be fearful of this innovation. Do not be fearful of challenging your models. Of course, it's always a difficult and complex thing to do, and there are always many interrogations of what, what the results will be. But I would tell them not to be fearful, because all of those who worked with us and who supported us in our highly uh, innovative approaches in the past few years in terms of architecture, in terms of uh, co-construction, in terms of materials, all of this, all of the, all of these people consider that they have made progress and that they've saved time uh, in embracing developments that are going to come in the future. And then, of course, we do need the private sector, very much so. We need also to restore uh, the collective and the political. We need to restore the rights that belong to them. But all of this should not be seen as something that is working against business. Uh, quite the opposite. We need jobs. We're going to need support for businesses throughout this crisis, uh, businesses and their employees. The crisis is going to be terrible. So we need to remain confident. We need to stay ourselves, but also accept that democracy must always have the last final word. A big round of applause for Hidalgo, who will stay here for another few minutes. Virginia Raggi. To what Anne Hidalgo said. Um, uh, a, a few minutes ago, you, you were talking about the need to have a more inclusive city, just like Anne Hidalgo, and you insisted on the fact that uh, we, we need to, uh, to be very inclusive and uh, nobody has to be uh, left behind. Uh, how could you react at, uh, at the, um, the, um, the speech of, uh, of Anne Hidalgo? Perhaps I you have a question for her. No, I totally agree. I see that all the main cities are going in the same direction. We are talking about the changing even before the pandemic. And this was the, the, the path that we were trying to, to, to follow and to lead at the same time. And what she said, when she said that nobody has to fear the change, I, I strongly and truly believe in this. Because changing is the the basis of life. Transformation is something that belongs to us. 
of course, the pandemic has been like an accelerator of all the changing, and we don't have to fear it. We have to lead and try to look forward and point to the place that we want to go, and we have to do it all together. Not to be afraid of the changes and no. considering something uh, like collapses as opportunities. Um, That's, we have to, excuse me, we yeah. have to see that every crisis and every problem they, they hide a big opportunity. So we have to see that opportunity and not the problem. Vous êtes complètement en phase avec ce que disait Anne Hidalgo. Euh, Anne Hidalgo, euh, une question que, que j'ai envie de vous poser so, concernant la, la Anne Hidalgo, culture. Anne Hidalgo, I have a question for you about culture. Uh, Virginia Raggi uh, was saying uh, earlier uh, that culture uh, is in uh, Rome's uh, DNA. Uh, and that's another common point. Well, yes, of course, you know that Rome and Paris are twin cities. Uh, we have an exclusive twin city agreement with Rome. Rome cannot have another twin city than Paris, and Paris cannot have another twin city than Rome. And then, of course, there's the Treaty of Rome. And it's true that to us, culture in Paris is very much part of our DNA. When I was talking about creative politics, populations, of course. I include artists into that, and all these men and women who help to reflect their vision of the world, or their interpretation of uh, uh, prior uh, creations. And to us, it's crucial that culture should be something that can be shared as widely as possible. In the 15-minute city I was talking about, the idea is that in this 15-minute city, that there should be a network of schools, of libraries, of uh, music schools, of uh, bookshops, which are, of course, uh, private sector businesses, that all of this could be networked with a very powerful synergy to also allow the artists in a given neighborhood and citizens of a given neighborhood, those uh, who are amateurs or, and those who are professionals, to get together and together reflect and express culture, which is crucial in that it elevates the human mind. That might be my conclusion, but I would say that if you watch a film or read a novel, you very often learn much more about society than by uh, reading other types of literature or writings, which, of course, uh, are worthy in themselves. But I think it also allows us to uh, confront different visions of the world. And Paris is a city that breathes culture, the freedom to create, creative freedom, and that's very much part of our DNA. So we're getting a few questions through the Slido app, so please feel free to ask questions. I have a question for you, Anne Hidalgo. What is your priority between energy transition and quality of, of life and user-friendliness for people who live in cities? There's, you need, there's a balance that needs to be struck. I don't see any opposition. I think the green transition, the environmental transition, improves people's quality of life. When we created these cycle paths, we say, ah, yes, but how can uh, no one is going to be cycling? Not everyone will be cycling in a city. No, of course not. But at least we're allowing everyone who wants to cycle uh, to cycle across 100% of the city. No one has lost anything. I have testimonials every day of people people, including uh, business leaders, who say, ah, it's changed my life. I never would have imagined uh, that I would step out from my company car and I now cycle to work. And, uh, and of course, bicycles are also economical, they're cheaper. So people said, ah, yes, but you're going to stop people who uh, come from outside Paris to come work in Paris, they won't be able to do that, and it's going to increase social inequalities and so on. But in fact, if you look at people who use public transport and people who use the road, um, things are very obvious. Uh, people who do not have so much money from the most modest social classes take public transport, and they always have. And those who would drive into Paris, who continue to drive into Paris, 
tend to be uh, more affluent people. So I think it can, that is something that can improve quality of life. There are things that are not necessarily visible, uh, but that do have a terrible impact. Air pollution, for instance, kills tens of thousands of people every year in a city like Paris. In Paris, it's 6,000 direct deaths uh, connected to pollution, which is huge. Let me now ask Virginia Ranji. Of Roma in terms of uh, changing, uh, leaving the car in the parking and uh, and take the, the bicycle. Well, during the pandemic, people understood that, and of course, we had laws specific on that. We couldn't really gather together uh, in the buses and public transport because we have to respect the, the physical distances. So people. Uh, um, in the lockdown, I mean, uh, those who need to go to work, of course, and especially after, they understood that there could be another or a different way to, to move inside the city and was with a uh, bicycle and two scooters. So we, we started to build um, bicycle lane and um, bicycle path, and we have a law now that allow this construction more easily. So we're now building more than 150 kilometers of uh, bike lanes and people are very happy. If I can say one thing, uh, which to me is quite uh, important and even uh, significant, we have a lot of accidents, car accidents and car crashes that injuries and, and, and kill people. And up to date, probably nobody and no media said car killed people. They always said uh, streets are dangerous um, or something like that. Now that bi uh, bicycle and two scooters are like going uh, in, in, I mean, in all our cities, we see some accident with six scooters, but not more though. I mean, someone may fall, okay? But it's normal. And now newspaper, they try to focus on how dangerous two scooter are. And we are still not focused on, on not focusing on the problem, which is car can cause injuries and can kill people. And they are like focusing on two scooter. That is not a problem. Pollution, car accident, uh, high speed in the city, they are, uh, all are against quality of life. So we have to drive this, I mean, slowly and gently drive these changes that will improve our city and quality of life. Slowly and gently, mais vous vous retrouvez uh, Anne Hidalgo dans ce que dit Virginia Radji. Uh, pour terminer, uh, Virginia Radji nous a dit tout à l'heure dans, dans, so, dans son interview. Virginia Radji was uh, saying Rome, earlier that in Rome, they also uh, turn towards uh, Paris uh, because uh, Paris uh, serves as a kind of lab, uh, an uh, innovation uh, lab. What would you want to say to Virginia? Paris now talks to Rome. So, first of all, of course, Paris draws a lot of inspiration from Rome, from other capital cities of the world. Virginia, what she was saying about accidents, think of Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a city which uh, already in the late 70s uh, initiated a uh, cycling uh, policy. And the reason for that was car accidents, which uh, had really uh, generated uh, uh, a lot of concern in Amsterdam, a lot of children were killed on the road and so on. And I think perhaps the message I would like to deliver is a European message. As mayors of major cities across Europe, we also have a part to play today. Of course, it's difficult for mayors to work together. We have a network. We can inspire each other. We, of course, try to influence domestic policies and European policies in order for them to focus much more on issues of the environmental and energy transition. And I think that with Rome and other cities across Europe, we must also go and see the European Commission in order for 
European cities to be places, places that can also directly receive European funds to work on the transition. It will be quicker and more efficient than to pass through national governments. Of course, national governments need to remain. I am not saying that nation states are useless, but for instance, in France, France is, is a country that is much too centralized and that does not leave sufficient space to local governments and municipalities uh, to work. And I think that is a fine territorial and democratic scale for us to act and accelerate the transition, which is absolutely essential. And perhaps also to accelerate a, a rebound as part of the European rebound and uh, act, uh, economic activity rebound plan, where we need to be stakeholders. A, a lovely conversation. Many thanks, Virginia Raggi, for joining us. Many voilà. thanks, and you know, envie de, plus loin dans, dans really ce film -là, makes you want to go even further in, the, in your twin cities. Merci. Twin ideas, twin visions. A great pleasure to Merci have Thank you. Thank you, Virginia.